I, that's pretty good. Did it. Perfect. <laughs> you so you wait. So you meant to clap, but instead of clapping, instead of putting your two hands no, together, I, you clicked on the mouse. You typed on a link. clap into chat. <laughs> Fuck my back. No, it's I tried to click back from the recording Did over to Did you clap the, that ass? <laughs> yes. <laughs> my ass is on fuego. <laughs> <laughs> This is Boss Barrel Radio. My name is Griffin Hoffman. You're listening to a podcast about friends talking about video games and other shit. Jeff Brewer is here. I am here. James Scherer, MD, is here. Am I here? He is. I can guarantee it. Am I? Now let's talk about Fast and Furious. Did you watch the trailer, Jamie? No. You, Why not? Because I've not? been working my buns off. <laughs> Straight I, off. Are the buns off. on fuego? <laughs> in this trailer, not only does Tyrese Gibson yell, "My ass is on fuego." <laughs> yep. There's also That's a scene the part you got to censor the word "fire," not "ass." <laughs> There's also a scene where <laughs> Dominic Toretto drives a car onto a bridge rope and then turns it into like oh, yeah. an uncharted four style grappling hook and then grapples the car. Around a he cliff uses face. his car tire to grab a rope and swing <laughs> adventure or pitfall style around an island. <laughs> My favorite part of that clip is not when not when that happens. It's when they're going to do it. Oh, and, and, and Letty's like, "Oh, you're doing this," as yeah, if she knows as that as this she has, has been done before. As if she has any idea what <laughs> possible thing he could be doing in order to get over a bridge that doesn't exist. Right? Can I can I ask you both a question? No. So, so I've seen the first one like maybe three million times, okay. but I've never seen the ones that came after. Let me ask you this: what ha- what happened to the family drama? What it's, happened? It's, it's always been there. What are you talking about? It's there? <laughs> they're they're all family. Well, hold okay. on. They're all family, except when sometimes family isn't family. <laughs> well, yeah, that does happen. <laughs> because John sometimes Cena... Sometimes you get brainwashed. John Cena is Dominic Toretto's ha- uh, half-brother? Full brother? Unconfirmed. <clears throat> yeah. Are there clones? Uh, you're dipping into the Hobbs and Shaw realm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, okay. that's, that's, okay. that's more that realm, yeah. Okay, yeah. gotcha. <laughs> there are people coming back from the dead, though. Yeah, I'm not happy about that. <laughs> so let me... it, it basically excised Tokyo Drift, the best mm. of the Fast and Furious, out of canon at this point by eliminating all the characters from that movie and then bringing back the only character that had any sort of gravitas to, <laughs> to the actions that happened to them. No, apparently they are, have other characters that were in the trailer. <clears throat> I read online. Other uh, Tokyo Drift people. Like they're in like a like a freeze frame or something. Oh no, there's been they brought back the the doofy main character from Tokyo Drift, but then like they they just immediately pushed him to the side. They're like, yeah, well, this, <laughs> you have zero charisma. You're at, you're at a nega chariz- negative charisma score here, buddy. Are you hoping Bow Wow comes back? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jamie, you'll be happy to know that if you've seen the first movie many times. The trailer opens with Dominic Toretto going, I used to live my life a quarter mile at a time. time. (laughs) But now it's about family. (laughs) Jeff, were you perplexed when he, when she gives him the the child who is like fucking like slightly (laughs) older Boba Fett? Um, like the cross or the key or whatever the hell it was and then there's a it cuts to a scene where it's like dominic like gripping the the thing as if he's gonna just rip it off the kid's neck like, for your protection to what's gonna happen next someone pointed out that in that trailer D- dom has a car thrown at him and maybe catches it i thought it was the brother Oh, maybe it was John Cena. I, I, people thought it was Dom. <laughs> uh, the thing that the, there is one, um, there is one theme that that permutates the later Fast and Furious movies that I absolutely love, which is if you can, if somebody is falling from a great height and you can 
You basically catch them with the hood your of your car. car, and they are completely fine because it's like a soft blanket on the hood that's, of your car. That's how cars are designed. Yeah. Elon Musk. Is Elon Musk in any of these? No. Not yet. Aww. Elon Musk. If Elon Musk is in a fast movie, I'm going to be very sad. I think. I, that, I, I think that the Elon Musk the the Musk truck was was influenced by the design of some of like the experimental cars in the Fast and Furious. I just want to wink at the end of the movie, like post credit scene, like bad guy takes his face off and it's Elon Musk. Wink and like whoa! Everyone's minds are blown. Hobbs and Shaw and Elon. Do we? Here's the question. Do we think that John Cena will join the family, or do you think that he will be deceased? Well, since they cannot kill a single character in any of these movies. <laughs> Except for Paul Walker, may he rest in peace. The, right, yeah. <laughs> if they had their druthers, he would be back. You know it. You know we'd have CG. We have the technology. Right, yeah. right. Oh, man. It's such a good trailer. You got to watch it's it, It's very Jamie. good. It's very good. <laughs> One last question about this. Is this series now cross-promotional in the way that, like, at the end of the movie, like, pop the pop the trunk, who's in there, Baby Yoda? Is that, like, out of the question? No, uh, is that not out of the question. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't know. I think it might be out of the question. They have gone into full, full-on, like, supernatural powers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it's become a combination of G.I. Joe and Bond movie where it's like people throw cars at each other. Cars have indeterminable amount of weight and gravity affixed to them. Um, like we discussed the, the slow fall mechanics of the, the, that the hood provides. Um, nitrous <laughs> oxide is your magic, is your MacGuffin. Uh, mm-hmm. there's a magnet plane. There's a mag. They got a goddamn magnet plane. <laughs> Piloted by Charlize Theron oh, with yes. another ridiculous hairstyle. The <laughs> only thing I know about the series of the, outside of the first movie is that in the second, in Tokyo Drift, they would press the NAS button and then they'd go into hyperspeed, like Star Trek style, but yeah. the speedometer would say like 45 miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't understand. Well, when you when you drift in, man, if you're out of control, you're in control. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah that's just, yeah, that explains yeah. it. Got yeah. it. <clears throat> oh, man. You, the thing is, this one's directed by Justin Lin, and the Justin Lin ones, they're all, like, objective. Like, they're they're very dumb in he, the he best did, ways. He's the Tokyo Drift one, right? That was Justin but, Lin? Yeah, all the Justin Lin <sighs> ones have really so good, good action. Um, yep. Very they, stylistic, like, yeah. bullshit. Yeah. That that's the director you want to pay attention to on this series. Mm. My, Don't you th- my besides everything in Tokyo Drift, my absolute favorite was, I think it was Fast and Furious six, five or six. The one where they first okay, I should step this back. There's two great scenes. One is the first time they introduce Dwayne the Rock Johnson and him and and Dominic um, Toretto. Uh, <laughs> otherwise known as Vin Diesel, uh, get into, like, a uh, uh, balls-out wrestling, like, knuckle brawl, ma- like, fight match, wrestle match, where at there some point, somebody goes through a table. But up to this point, like, you've you've admired Dom as, like, oh, look, he's just just perpetual wife-beater-wearing, ripped, completely smooth human being. And, uh, <laughs> completely smooth. And, 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 then, and then enter The Rock, who's, like, the, the, like, the evolution of fucking <laughs> Vin Diesel. He's the third form where it's, like, now you've got muscles and you're taller. And, and, and they put them on this, like, equal setting where Dominic and, I don't know, well, I guess... Josh Hobbs. Hobbs. He's Hobbs. Yeah. Uh, they have this brawl, and it's just like, it's laughable. We're like, no, no, small, small smooth man will, will perish to large smooth man. <laughs> I and feel then like- the other great scene is when, when Hobbs is in the hospital, and then he oh. uh, has to exit and get his shit going, and he flexes so hard that he yeah. breaks the cast off that's, his arm. That's, that's, that's amazing. Six. <laughs> and, yeah, f- five is is where they where they introduce him, I believe. That's the I, real one, which is a really good movie. I Sorry, feel like ahead, the Jamie. natural progression of this, like the last. So what is this? This is nine, right? So there's probably yes. going to be ten. And I so, think you should end at ten. Ten nope, should be directed. No, it should never end. Listen, just listen to me, please. Ten should be directed by Quentin Tarantino, and it should star Daniel Day Lewis. What do you think? <laughs> I was going to say should, David Lynch. I was going to say it should star Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> if it's a Quentin Tarantino film it's true uh, you, I'll have to catch up on all these maybe today I'll watch it like five times speed you don't need to watch 
just just watch the most recent one. I feel like if you're disoriented, it's kind of better. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you've made it this point and you've watched one a bunch, just go watch the most recent one and see how that tickles you. Uh, I would suggest the one that's in Rio where they first introduce um, uh, the Shaw or the Hobbs character. And then, I mean, always you can always and forever watch Tokyo Drift because it is the best uh, Fast and Furious. And it stars the oldest brother from Home Improvement. Nice. Nice. <laughs> um, and Lil Bow Wow when he was still Lil. <laughs> and it's in Japan, so it's it's even better. Cool. Sadly, uh, The Rock and um, Vin Diesel will not work together anymore, though. Oh, what really? Yeah, there's a lot of drama. They don't like each other. Why? Why? Because I guess... Like I said, one's the evolution of the other. <laughs> Apparently, Vin Diesel doesn't have the best work ethic. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I mean, he rock. only he only lives his life a quarter mile at a time. <laughs> it's very inaccurate. <laughs> My God. Uh. Anyway, how about some video games? How about them? Nah. You want to talk about other movies that are really good? <laughs> how about that Mandalorian? I haven't seen it yet. I do have I, Disney Plus now, though. I really nice. liked it. I, I, I loved it. I, my excitement and enjoyment for that series was like a U-shape. But uh, I, in mm. the end, I, I came out pretty positive on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I love anything with Werner Herzog, and also I didn't realize that uh, the IG robot was played, voiced by Wakit, Wakit, Jamie, help me out with your Jojo boy. Taika Waititi? Yeah, and that last, I think the last episode was directed or written by him, one of the two. Wait. And he's also in Jojo Rabbit. He plays Hitler in Jojo Rabbit, which yeah. is amazing. amazing. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. Wait, oh, quick, God, you guys must see it. Quick question. Uh, how is Werner Herzog involved in... The he's, a, a he, character. he's in it. He's, he's, in it, he's like a pseudo Nazi um, empire person. Yes, the dude. Fuck? He wants. He wants. This child is very really important she must to bring me. The child. Bring me the child. What? <laughs> this is. It's, what? It's, as, it's as good as it sounds. What? There is much Mandalorian metal for your procuring this <laughs> child. Does he? At any point, does he talk about nihilism? He, does he, talk he about... says, you must not listen to the tape. You must destroy it. <laughs> you must not listen to it. It's so good, dude. Wow. I did not know yeah. that. It's I, good. I got to check it out. It's and have good. you guys seen The Witcher yet? Nah. Yeah, I watched the first episode and I fell off it. No, dude, you got to keep going. The first <laughs> two episodes, the first two episodes are, are like a train wreck, but that like is cool. part of its charm. Get out of the hinterlands. Get out of the, the show. hinterlands. I was gonna say. <laughs> no, but it's like it's like fun. It's like fun hinterlands. That's janky and broken, and you can like you, you know your character is. You spawning. can choose to not watch it. You, you know, you look to the left. There's someone over there in a T pose. You're like, oh, that's fun. <laughs> It didn't land for me. It was, much like the game, it was a little tedious and a little bit too kind of dark and brooding and up its own ass. <laughs> the best was... thing about that show is just Henry Caviezel, and you're like, ah, God, that man is beautiful. Every time I try to play The Witcher 3, I feel like it's a little too dark and brooding, and I'm like, eh. Yep. I'm with you, Jeff. I, I really uh, want to like it, though. I, mm -hmm. I've bought it on, I think, two platforms now. It's, it's what I'm the most worried about Cyberpunk, is it's going to just... It's going to have a flavor that doesn't jive with me. That's exactly where I am. It's, it's it so interesting, because I feel like, on the face of it, immediately, both the show and the game, I kind of get the sense of, um, we're in on it, and we know this is stupid. And maybe that's, like, integral to my enjoyment of it. But uh, I did get the sense, especially the show, the show to me is like as campy as a Buffy, which is part of why I liked it. I get the sense from the little I played of The Witcher, which isn't much, that they're definitely in on it. Like it's not, it doesn't take itself too, too seriously, but I still just don't really enjoy the beats that it, it opens with anyway. I know that it's supposed to like get a lot better when you play farther, but that I always just bounce right off it and I'm like, I don't mm -hmm. really care about this world. Yep. <clears throat> That's too bad, because I really find, like most people, I haven't gotten through probably half of the main game, even though I've bought the expansions, I haven't probably gotten through half of the main game, and I still feel like I just had such an incredible time. I did the uh, Bloody Baron quest, and was like, this is good, this is intense, this is well written, and then it was like, and now what? And the game was like, I don't know. I was like, huh, okay. The, the thing is, like, 
um, in his recent videos, uh, Tim Rogers recently pre-reviewed Final Fantasy VII remake, and he was oh, talking about he was talking about pre-review, this. huh? Yeah, yeah, he started doing this. They're pretty fun. Have you? They're really good. <laughs> it's not um, a preview; it's a pre-review. It's yeah. a pre-review. Also, Love he it. doesn't. He's a kind of person who goes on like media blackout, so it's just him being goofy. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he was talking about the quality of the side quests in The Witcher. And oddly enough, I agree with a lot of what he said, which is like, there are smaller quests in The Witcher 3 that take maybe a third or even a quarter of the time as the Bloody Baron quests <clears throat> that are even better than the Bloody Baron quest. That like, you'll, you'll just meet a character who is only going to be in the game for a total of maybe... 30 minutes but that character is so fleshed out and has a name and a backstory and incredible acting and uh like keyframed animation and all of this crazy stuff and it's like and then and then he's gone and you never see him again and and that happens like again and again and again and again um and i feel like that's where the game really shines even more so than the side quests or, or the main quests or even like the bigger side quests i feel like the witcher 3 really shines when you're like just in a random town you meet a random person who's gonna entertain you for half an hour and then he's done like you that's know, maybe, where maybe you're selling me on it i should maybe give it another shot because uh, since i've been doing D D stuff like i i now have like a different perspective on video game quality um in terms of like world building and character interaction um so what you're saying is like the things that i always really am impressed by games like for example god of war i think did did that immensely but it did it it's like so concentrated you you only take on maybe less than 10 characters and Hmm. you have that so if you're saying the witcher can do that at a level that's like oh there are many characters that uh all have their own like well-wrote backstories that does kind of feel like a self-contained module that sounds cool yeah, and it'll even be enemies. Like you'll meet this the like the most grotesque enemy you've ever seen, and you're like, "All right, just let me fight you and let me get this over with, and then I'll move on to the next quest." And it's like, "No, that that's a character. You're gonna meet that character, and then if you want to fight them at the end, you can. But like, you know, then then you're gonna move on. But let's let's uh, let's uh, s- slow mosey through this. <laughs> yeah. So so I think um, uh, that's a good segue into. <laughs> The fact that I've been playing Dragon Quest, whatever number it is. It's, it's, that's, that's it's my Witcher. dog. Witcher, stop it. <laughs> I was going to say, it's funny, Griff, that you took that to Dragon Quest, because I had the same thought about the nameless nobodies. Mm. Um, and I think it also connects to the game I played, but I, I want to give you your due. I just wanted to quickly say that I'm in the same place as Griff, where like it keeps bouncing off me, but I know that I can enjoy it, and I really want to give it its due. I just haven't yet. But go ahead, Griff. Talk Dragon Quest. Sure. I After last time, I got it, I played it, and I'm giving it its time. I haven't had a lot of time to play games since the last uh, go of this, but um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's it's really not grabbing me at all. Uh, I made it to the title card, I guess. Um, the that's, late title card. Is that when you jump off the... Waterfall. Yeah. Yeah. Waterfall. And I assume yep. that's where things really start, you know, hitting the ground in terms of pacing and opening up. And Definitely. It, it is, it, like, my barometer of, of, like, God of War quality of lore and storytelling and world building and, and character design, and not not just design, but, like, character fleshing out. Um, it's I'm like, oh, this fucking game, huh? This is, <laughs> this is a JRPG that just didn't grow up. Um, so, I, again, I'll give it its due diligence since we're in the kind of the, the, the slow months. Um, but it's just, I don't know. Like, I think some of the th- praise for it has been a little hyperbolic. Um, it's an <laughs> RPG doing its RPG thing. I would agree with that. I, I think that y- you're right, Griff, though, that, like, after you hit that title card, like the game kind of does this thing. It's just in an homage to all previous Dragon Quest games because the first game was just one character. It it kind of doesn't put its absolute best foot forward in terms of not really giving you a full party, not letting you have a lot of character interaction. Um, but after you after that title card, you are going to start to get some of the kind of trademark vignettes and 
you know, kind of charming characters. Again, it's I would never expect it to be like a God of War type situation where like you're like, oh, that really makes you think. <laughs> oh, no, sure. And that, that's fine. Like the the like the that like splash uh, after the po- after the title card where it's like, we're going to take all the cutscenes and just jam into one hot second here so you can see what you're going to get into. I was like, ah, neat. Look at that guy. He's a, he's an old man who does karate or something. Yeah. That looks cool. Like. I'm excited to meet these characters, but then I'm also like, this is probably going to just be a JRPG where everybody's an archetype and nobody's actually interesting and everything's tedious. I mean, again, there are definitely archetypes. It's, it's you know, it's the video game equivalent of, like, sipping hot cocoa by the fire. Like, it's mm-hmm. not... <clears throat> don't go in there expecting D&D storytelling. Right. Um, and if that's a, a, a non-starter for you, that's a non-starter, but it definitely gets its hooks into you in terms of just... Like, it, it's never going to absolutely blow you away or surprise you in what it does, but it what it does, it does really comfortably and really nicely. Like, it doesn't... Yeah. I'm excited to get into the town vignettes that you guys mentioned, and then also to, like, get a bigger party to have combat be more meaningful than just yep. the attack, attack, attack. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about what that will yield, but my suspicion is it's not going to hook me. Uh, so it won't have like a it won't have like a a mechanic that I find interesting in an RPG where it's like that push pull of like strong weak uh, str- st- strategy in combat. You, so this you, is what I'm yeah, about to say uh, <clears throat> is not defending the game because I I don't think that you should have to play a game for a long time before it gets good. But I actually <laughs> I actually fell off the game completely at eight hours. So I played this game for eight hours and I had especially in the very beginning, the exact same reaction you had. And just because... And then I completely fell off it. So I probably played eight hours of this game several months ago. I completely fell off it. And then just because I was just in the mood for that type of thing, and I remembered the experience, and I remembered thinking, yeah, I could go for some of that now, picked it back up, didn't start over, just started right back in where I was at eight hours. I didn't remember what had happened in the story. It didn't matter. Didn't remember any of the mechanics. It didn't matter. And I just start picked up at eight hours again, and then I completely fell in love with it. And I think part of the reason why I fell in love with it was, A, I was coming back to it knowing what it was and craving that. And also, <clears throat> unfortunately, it is the type of game that, like, you know, gets gets much better at 12 hours and gets like really a lot better at like 25 hours and you know it's that's you can't you can't uh, excuse a game for that but that just happens to be that's just the reality of this game i think that there's this unfortunate fact that like the dragon quest fan base expects a lot of homage and a lot of nostalgia Mm -hmm. and the game kind of front loads with this very slow kind of uh trotting opening or prodding open plotting opening whatever um where like you have your one character, you spend a long time with just that one character, then you get two, then you get four pretty quickly, and it's it really starts to pick up. I, I think it's still pretty fun with two, but once you have a full party, it, it definitely um, – the strategy starts to emerge. I would say that the, the one thing that might hook you in terms of mechanics, Griff, is um, pep powers are kind of cool. Um, okay. They're fl- I mean, again, it's not – you know, don't expect anything – earth shattering but once you have multiple party members um and depending on the skills you learn your characters can get pepped up which just basically means like their abilities become enhanced and if multiple characters pep up at the same time you can use powers which uh like do various things um depending on what kind of powers you use and it becomes kind of like a a you want to maximize the amount of time that your characters are pepped up, but when they use the powers, their pep goes away, but the peps are limited. So there's some cool stuff going on there. And you don't, you, there's some hidden math in regards to when you get pepped, and that's kind of cool to think about. And also, there's each character has a sphere grid. It's very Final Fantasy X esque in terms of, you know, what the characters, how the characters' class abilities play into how you use them in combat and which of those elements on the sphere grid you're going to unlock. And when you unlock certain things on the sphere grid you get new pet powers yes. that usually combine two characters together so you're rewarded for mixing and matching characters in battle and there's uh seven character i i have seven characters right now i think and there's four that you can use uh at once but the game make encourages you to swap to, them. C- to swap them because everyone is leveling at the same time like a modern pokemon <clears throat> game and also um when your char- when your characters die in battle, 
instead of them just if you wipe, it just brings in some more people. Yeah. So oh. like, that, FF, that okay. FF10 thing, right, where you have your seven characters you can swap in and out. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, it's really fun. And so part of the interesting moments in combat come from, oh, I didn't really want to use these two people together, because, but, you know, he's dead and I don't have any way to bring him back right now. So let's swap this guy in. And then, like, something cool happens between those two characters that you didn't even want to fight together. And then you're like, oh, my God, now I can use them in this way going forward so it's re- that's kind of cool but yeah but no doubt all of this is buried under 25 hours <laughs> of- i wouldn't say 25 hours i would say that <laughs> that it starts to get pretty fun probably around the time that you hit the the desert i think that's when it starts to get pretty cool that's true what is that maybe 12 15 uh, i mean i i'm i'm there at like six hours and I would say that it's oh. it's, it's oh I, at this point I am not doing a fucking single side quest. It is mainline. Get me to when it get good. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, you're not going to hit a lot of side quests between um, yeah. where you are and when it get good. Like you have one more dungeon maybe to go through before I think you're going to start feeling a little bit more pulled by what's going on in the game. Okay. Um, well, you, you go to a town, which I think has some good story hey, beats. Hey, by the way, um, that, that bullshit sneaking and that bullshit runaway things, that was all bullshit, right? Like, you guys don't think that was good, do you? Uh, I don't even remember what you're talking about. The bullshit runaway thing was, was like, un, you're talking about from the dragon? Yeah. That was like unfailable. You just hold the button. Right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that you guys weren't like, "Wow, wow, what a what a triumph for for oh, an no. RPG to run no. away from." No, thing it, no, and that not was, fight it. That was it, no. That was just more like, "Oh, you know, here's some storyline, some light story." Um, sure. You know, I forgot that happened. Meet, meet Eric. Like that. Yeah. That's that is a non. That's nothing to write home about. Um, okay, good, 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 good. Yeah, you, Eric is nothing to write home about. Oh, good, good, even better. He's just <laughs> like your fucking Yosuke best friend that sucks. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he gets a little more interesting later, but I... Uh, yeah, he, he's he's charming, but he's he he doesn't have a lot going on. I would okay, say yeah. Silvando is definitely my favorite character. I like, I like pretty much everyone else, and I like how a lot of the characters, like, obviously the two sisters, you know, you're going to hear their story together, and Jade and, and Rab, you're going to hear their story together, and I like that. I like how it's not like, okay, you're going to Wutai, and this is where you get Yuffie, yeah. and this is Yuffie's story. It's There's like, definitely no, some, some dyads in that game. Yeah, exactly. So that's cool. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, uh, so, speaking it, of so Yuffie, definitely. we have to talk about something besides Dragon Quest, so uh-huh. let's move on. <laughs> Okay. Um, shall I tell you guys about my time with Disco Elysium? Yes. Yeah. So uh, when you were talking about <clears throat> um, some of the storytelling in The Witcher, that's what kind of took me over to Disco Elysium and mm. this game. So as with every like deep Western RPG, I feel like I have this experience where I start it and I'm like, I don't understand. <laughs> and I just I just stopped. So Disco Elysium, like I started, I was like, this seems pretty cool. I played about 10 minutes and I was like, okay, I'm done. I can't do this. Um, <laughs> wow, that's a hard cut. <laughs> Dude, 10 minutes, 10 minutes is like nothing. 10 minutes is the blink of an eye in this game. You maybe walked across a room. In Disco? Yeah. Now that right? I'm playing it hard, uh, the hours disappear so fast. Hmm. Exa- cool. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, but I just, I felt overwhelmed. I was like, this storytelling, like, is is good, but, like, hard for me to jive with, I guess. I don't know, it's just something that I haven't, like, fully internalized. Like, I guess, um, CRPG-style writing and things like that. Because it's from the West. What's that? Because it's from the West. It's from the West, yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. Where are the anime body pillows? Right, yeah. Where's my waifu? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I came back to it, and I started fresh. Um, and that is, like, the best written game I have ever played. It is cool. so... It is a... Uh, th- there's a lot to talk about with it, but first of all, like, so... It's very political. Um, mm. Does not shy away at all from, like, stuff that very clearly... Me- like, it's a made-up world, um, which actually has some supernatural elements, which I did not expect. Uh, they're mm-hmm. very far removed from the main story, at least right now. But they came up in a very unexpected way, which I thought was really cool. What, but, what is the supernaturalism? Is, is, it, it, is it that there was a monster as the president? <laughs> I would say that's not supernatural no. at all. No, 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 no. It's a, there's this, I won't get too deep into it because you'll learn about it, but there's like a, a substance that covers a lot of the world that basically makes people go crazy. 
Um, and I'm excited now. It's possible that you will play the game and not even learn about it. It was buried Whoa. relatively deep in a conversation tree with a character that I took a shine to for some huh. reason or another. Um, but anyway, so this is a game that's super political. Um, it's set in a world that is very much like our own world, except slightly remixed. Um, it is it like lampoons like the New World Order very very well. Like it's basically like Europe is bad. <laughs> like like <laughs> Europe is all the bad things about the West. It makes fun of like incremental incremental progress and like uh, you know Enlightenment style approach to government and things like that. Like, but it does it in a way like I this is not. <laughs> So, like, I, I, you know, sometimes in, in different points in my life, I've been more or less supportive of, like, the status quo, as it were. This game, I feel like if you showed it to someone who was like, yeah, I like things as they are, like, it, it so effectively undercuts that entire message without making any other message out to be good. Like, I feel like as I play this game, I, I feel like I'm actually learning about, like, the futility of all political systems in, like, mm. a genuine way. Um so anyway, so yeah, it's like, it's it's got this really strong streak where it's like dunking on like, you know, New World Order, um, you know, wealthy Westerners imposing their values on the rest of the world. But then it also is like, hey. When, when you say New World Order, you're referencing the late 90s phenomenon of the NWO uh, with <laughs> WCW, correct? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Woman Crush Wednesday, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but then it also is like unions are terrible too. Like the you, uh, the, yeah. the union is a big presence, and the guy who runs the union is like my least. He's a really well written character, but he's like such a freaking asshole. I hate him so much. Cool. <laughs> Um, and every interaction I have with him just makes me feel gross inside. Even though, like, in terms of politically, like, that's probably where I would land politically. Like, I'd be on the side of, of, of the union, right? But, mm -hmm. like, this character is, like, a terrible mobster who wants you to do awful things. And the character that I like the best is, like, this person who's profiting off of, like, free market, you know, liberal, neoliberal values and all this stuff. But she's, like, very clear-headed about the fact that she's doing that. And... I don't know. The game just does such a good job of making its characters into human beings um, and making you want to learn more about them. And then you, the, the main character, are just like a total. You're train just wreck. so you're a total train wreck. Like you're you, you're. You, I I initially thought when I was reading about this game that like okay like you kind of had some control over your character's history. Like you could actually role play elements of of like non present for them in real time. Like you could say like oh like. I was a shitty cop, or I was a good cop. Um, but no, like, you have a backstory that's <laughs> It's pretty... all shitty cop, isn't it? It's all just, it's all like, shitty different cop. flavors of shitty cop. Well, no, it's not exactly all shitty cop. Like, you learn more about who you are. That's all set in stone. But the oh, game just does such a good job of letting you react to that and deal with that. And the way in which you sort of, like, build your so-called class is really cool. You have these you have these thoughts which pop up from time to time based on how you interact with the world. And you can choose to either internalize them or not internalize them. And some of them will give you, like, static bonuses. Some of them will open new conversation options. Um, but it's just... It's such a cool game, and there's no combat, um, which is really refreshing, but it's still super engaging, super systems-driven... Um, lots of dice rolls and skill checks and things like that. Um, and it's like not a huge landmass, but the world is just so deep. And it, it does that thing where like it, there, there is a truth to, in the case that I'm trying to solve right now, but it kind of doesn't matter. Like it matters, but it I don't know. It, it's hard to even explain it, but it's like you have so much freedom in the ways that you... Just like in real cop work. Yeah. <laughs> There's a truth, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> that you but like it push, does matter, but it doesn't. You, like, push and prod different characters, and, like, I don't know. It's I, I feel like this is a game where, like, I could probably pin the case on anyone. It's about solving a murder um, hmm. and get away with it. I am looking for the truth, but I don't think you have to. Um, huh. It's just really cool. Uh, I don't feel like you have to do anything, which is really kind of uh, the most jarring thing about the game for me. Um, and it, it took me a while to get used to it, and it, now I feel like I definitely want to play it. But it's kind of, oddly enough, I kind of in my own head equate it with 
like the hanging with your buds phenomenon of DQ11. Mm. It's like, I'm not here to do any one thing in particular. I'm here to go with the flow and enjoy my time in this space. And like, that's, that's what I'm there for. I agree with that. And I think the, so the way that the game progression in the game works is you, you get tasks and you can elect to either do them or not do them. But like the way in which these tasks emerge are, is super organic. Like you'll like be checking out a body and you'll be thinking to yourself like, oh man, that body has some really cool boots on it. And then like the part of your brain that's like, let's be naughty is like, Hey, you want to steal those boots? And you're like, yeah, I do want to steal them. Or like, no, nah, I don't think I want to steal them. And if you say you do want to steal them, it's like, all right, steal the boots and you'll get some experience. And if huh. you don't, you might get a different path to get experience. Is, is there, is there an inclination to min max? Um, I, I think the game would actively dissuade you from doing that in various ways. Cause I yeah. feel like the game is, the game is going to give you plenty of, options, very tantalizing options that you want to do and it'll tell you up front, like, this is going to be really hard and you're probably not going to be able to do this and we're going to punish you if you fail yep. and then you're going to be like, ah, let's try it anyway and then you will fail. Yeah, and then and, the game's going to punish you. And, and Are you safe scumming? What's that, Griff? Are you safe scumming? Um, I've safe scummed a couple times, but the, the thing is the game... No shame. You should. All games, you should save scum. Like this. More than, and, and the reason I'm safe scumming is because I don't want to necessarily replay it anytime soon because totally. it's a yeah, long yeah, yeah. game. Yep. But the thing is, this is a game where fail states happen. Um, and sometimes oh, they're not, they're not easily safe scummed or like it, like some, the game has two types of checks. There's white checks and red checks. White checks can be retried and red checks can't. Hmm. Um, and sometimes like failing a check isn't so bad and actually leads to some interesting story beats. Like, I yeah. um, just to give you an example, I did, uh, and this is a little bit of a spoiler, but not a huge one. So in the beginning of the game, um, uh, your your character is like wandering around in this hostel and finds a microphone, and he's like, uh, some part of you is like, you should sing karaoke there, <laughs> and like you can be like, no, that's a terrible idea, or you can be like, yes, I'm going to do that. Um, and I said, yes, I'm going to do that. So it opened up a whole quest line where it's like, okay, let's sing karaoke. And, like, I had to find, like, a an appropriately sad song. Or, no, you, you get to choose, like, what kind of song you want to sing. So you can be like, I'm going to sing a sad song or I'm going to sing a happy song. And I chose a sad song. And then um, I found the sad song. And I went up there and it was like, okay, you have one chance to do this right or do this really poorly. And I, I experimented with both the fail state and the win state. And both of them gave me experience and both of them led to interesting developments. But, like, it's just kind of how I want my character to be. Like, do I want my character to go up there and nail it and be, like, a friggin' legend? Or do I want my character to fail miserably and have everyone laugh at him? Because that, in and of itself, is a cool story beat, too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And there's a lot of that in this game. Like, you can fail, but then that gives your partner, who's a really cool character who I haven't even touched on yet... Um, it gives your partner a chance to, like, step up and save your ass, and that can develop your relationship. You can get around skill checks with your partner and just be like, let him do it. Or, like, th there's just so much freedom in the ways in which you interact with the world. And, and I think the game's definition of winning is a little different from uh, from other games. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think that uh, it's it's like a completely different type of game like I felt like I had to constantly be um, rejiggering my expectations from this game mm -hmm. in terms of what I'm going to be able to do the scope of what I'm going to be able to do and what I should expect to get from those experiences like when it when it became clear to me it, very early on the game suggests <sighs> like if you want to get some money you should sell some cans and if you want to, like, like you should pick up some aluminum cans and yeah, sell them. Yeah. And, and if you want to do that, you're going to need a bag to put the cans in. And at first, when I heard that, I was like, well, that sounds extremely tedious and stupid and boring. And then I was like, but then there's something about the game that, that is able to kind of give you a certain perspective that takes that um, idea away and replaces it with, if I can get a plastic bag and I can get some cans and I can sell them 
I am a god <laughs> in this game. Like it, it like re, it completely like restructures, and and, and that's going to be fun, and I want to do that. And like I, I feel, I think that's pretty special for a game to be able to do that. I, I don't know. Also, um, you get very little money from doing that. And the way that I've made some of my biggest sums of money is you can just go around and ask people if they have money. You just go, hey, do you have money? And then they're like, yeah. And you're like, can I have some of it? <laughs> so every new character I meet, I just am like, hey, do you have money? Can I have some of it? <laughs> I've, I've started doing that, too. It's surprisingly, at first you would think, like, I feel like if this game was written by, like, Americans, you would expect a certain level of derision when you ask that question. But instead, these characters are all like... Oh, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Here you well, go. Well, some of them are, like, no problem. And some of them, when you ask them if they have money, they're hilarious about it. Like, there's a, like you basically are in, like, a slum, um, like a like a third world area, which uh, is, like, sometimes visited by rich people. So, like, if you ask the rich people about money, they'll be like, oh, yeah, I have money. And they'll be like, not on me, though. Like, you know, I don't have that many liquid assets. Like, it, they just do these <laughs> little things where you're, and like, then they'll like extol the virtues of capitalism and not give you anything. And the way, just like these little ways in which the, um, these conversation options both develop you as like a character who's kind of an idiot and kind of boorish, but also develop the other characters as like certain types of assholes or hypocrites is really cool. Yeah, definitely. Also, Man, um, I want to play it more. I found an event which I, have, well, I'm going to tell you two stories, actually. So a um, couple of events which you have no... The game does not signpost them at all. Um, I found them by being thorough and just interacting with a lot of people in the world. Um, so the first one involves a woman uh, who I encountered just, like, browsing through books. And um, it's pretty clear that she doesn't really have a lot of significance to the story. Uh, but I just basically went up to her and started harassing her. And... Um, the, the way that conversations play out is like different parts of your like thought process will display and kind of make suggestions. So like, as I was talking to this woman, like my empathy center was like, you should leave her alone. You're bothering her. And then like my, I don't know, my, some other part of me was like, no, 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 no. Like something's going on. You need to help her. Um, but clearly like she was like, please go. And so I just kept talking to her and I was like, your husband's missing, right? And she was like, no, my husband's not missing. Please go away. And he was like, what about your children? She's like, I don't have any children. And then he's like, well, something's wrong. You need my help, right? And she's like, no. And then somehow or another, we started talking about cockatoos. <laughs> I was like, Are your cockatoos missing. And she was like, no. And then he was like, maybe for some reason, he, he was like, maybe I'm a type of cockatoo. <laughs> I don't really know why or how. <laughs> is this um, the love scene? Like, where you fall in love? No. I don't even remember okay. exactly how this happened, but somehow or another, we landed on cockatoos, and the character being like, maybe I identify with a type of cockatoo, like it's my spirit animal. And then I got a quest to find out what type of cockatoo I was, which involved going into the bookstore, <laughs> asking the lady for books on cockatoos, Finding the book and then electing to steal the book because I didn't have any money. And then <laughs> reading the book and being like, I'm that kind of cockatoo. Going back out to the lady and being like, hey, guess what? I'm this kind of cockatoo. And her being like, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. Um, That's amazing. The other story I wanted to tell was I encountered these two guys who were wearing profane jackets. One said mm. F the world and the other one said um, piss F Blank, 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 T. Uh, for some reason, that's like a slur that they throw around a lot. They put stars in there to make it so that no one's saying it. But mm. I I talked to them and, and like one of the conversation options was like, hey, like, wouldn't it be cool if we took their jackets? <laughs> and I went through like a whole like mini quest line to get them to give up their jackets. Also, when I questioned them about the meaning of their jackets, they both had extremely philosophical explanations for them. And it was really good. <laughs> cool. <laughs> it's a super, it's a really cool game. It's a, uh, it's just super well written. It's a world you want to play around in. Um, there's just, there's so many choices for how you can elect to develop your character within that world and build your skills. Mm, cool. And it's full of cool fail states, so. That's awesome. Yeah. Nice. I want to play it. Yay! That's all I wanted to say about it, though. I'm super addicted, and I'm definitely going to beat it. Beat it. What about you? Get, get to the disco. Are you playing anything? 
me, I've just been playing a ton of uh, Dragon Quest. It's and, so good. Uh, I, I'm now realizing... Well, actually, I wanted to talk to you about this. So, I am playing Dragon Quest XI S with Echoes of an Elusic Age, whatever, the Switch version. And I get, and there's more stuff in it, but having not played the original, I don't know what's new and what's old. And I got to the second act of the game, um, and all of a sudden I'm getting a, a lot of stuff that I don't think you got at all, Jeff, right? Yeah. So when I got to the second act, um, I immediately went to the hero. Okay. I, yeah. So in this, so after about 40 hours, the bad guy wins. And that's not a spoiler. I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> and, uh, then, then things change and, and, you know, you, you're in Jeff's case, he just went straight back to playing the main character. Whereas I am playing a series of hugely fleshed out, like mini games, mini RPGs that are based on the other characters in your party, which I feel like if it, is is becoming so rewarding and so amazing and if you and if weren't there it would almost be like there would be no payoff for these characters being as fleshed out as they are and i feel like it's so odd that this wasn't in the main uh game and Je- and jeff when i say like when i say that uh with each of these characters it's like a really kind of fully fleshed out like um plot piece i i mean like with sylvando like you you start off in a certain location and I was thinking, okay, I'm probably going to get a little mini story in this location and that'll be it. And it's like, no, you're going to, you're going to build a different party with different characters what? and you're going to, and you're going to go from location to location for a few hours what? And, ex- and get a whole new story. It, when and, you say different characters, you mean characters who weren't in the main game? Characters who weren't in your in your uh, party in the main game, and they're not really like in your party in your they're party. Like, like, they're like hanging alongside you, and yeah, occasionally like doing attacks. Yeah, but they only do the attack that they do. You know, yeah, or and like, like a you know one of like three different things they could possibly do. But they're characters, and part of the funny thing about um, Sylvando's little plot line is that. He, you know, the bad guy has won and the world is bad. And so he wants to bring smiles back to people's faces. So he like amasses this army of weirdos that you're constantly swapping in and out of your party. And they all do like one attack and you can swap them out at a campfire. But it's like all of these people, there's like at least eight of them or nine of them. And you, you know, and and you're just going from city to city, like building, getting more of these people and they're joining your party. And, you know, you you have this nice little subplot and it comes to a nice close and then it ends. And now I'm Jade and I'm starting that, uh, you know, subplot. It's really cool, dude. And I can't believe it wasn't uh, in the main game. It's nuts to me. Yeah, no. um, It's interesting because... I don't know if that will um, – you'll have to tell me what you think when you get control of the hero back because I feel like not really fully knowing what's going on in the world um, was pretty powerful as the hero. But um, mm. I don't know. I'm curious. So it, it'll be interesting to hear what, what you think. But uh, the story beats that happen when you do get the hero back I thought were really cool. Okay. Cool. I'm excited. Yeah. At, at the same time, I'm a, I'm like a little worried because I'm like this game is long enough. Like, I, <laughs> how much more is this adding to uh, to the whole thing overall? But no, I've been playing that, and um, I played a little more Blasphemous, which I continue to enjoy a lot. I think I'm gonna beat that game. Hopefully, um, Jeff, did you beat that game? No, I don't own it yet. I uh, I missed the sale, and then I was like, eh, I'll wait. It's a really good game, dude. Yeah. No, I, I definitely want to get it. I'm just. I, and, you know, where I'm not actively playing it right now, I figured I would just mm. kind of bide my time. And and also one thing I've been playing, which uh, I've just been, I mean, I'm super pumped for Doom. I think of the three of us, I was into Doom way, way, way more than uh, you guys were. But as I've told you guys in the past, I play Doom. I've played Doom probably every month since its release. And I'm just constantly playing Doom. But what I realized is I've just been... Um, playing the same save 
and you know you can go back to the levels and like find more of the secrets and stuff but i realized that you know within that save i've been playing on the easiest difficulty and which is which is great like if you it's still fun it's still challenging it's still interesting but what i started doing recently is i started a new save on the third out of five difficulties and it's like a completely different game and um it's really really fascinating the ways in which it's different and i think it's probably going to be closer to based on what i've heard about doom eternal it's going to be probably closer to what Doom Eternal is going to make you do. Because from everything that, um, you know, I've watched a lot of developer interviews and stuff with Doom Eternal, and it seems like they're really prioritizing, you know, it's not, they keep saying it's not going to be hard like Sekiro hard, it's not going to be hard like, like a Souls-like hard, but it's going to, it is going to prevent you from progressing if you're just playing with the same gun and you're not, switching guns based on enemy types like there's going to be some hard stops in doom eternal and that those were there in doom 2016 but not if you're playing on the light on the easiest difficulty on the easiest difficulty you can just pick the gun you want and just blow through the game and it feels great but now that i'm playing on you know a mid-tier difficulty it's it really does feel like just constant combat puzzles and it's really really cool and really good And probably what reviewers were responding to when it got the effusive praise it did in 2016, but Mm -hmm. I never really experienced. And it's just such, it's such a phenomenal, um, game in so many ways. Neither of you beat it or, or played it significantly? That's Jamie. Griff played the heck out of it. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I think Griff really loved it. You did? Dude, why am I? It was why my am I favorite missing... game of 2016. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I played why? like an hour. <laughs> you probably picked some horse shit like uh, Firewatch or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I probably am taking Jeff, what I remember of Jeff's experience and Correct. just like... Or yeah. probably Overwatch more than likely. Yeah. Nope, it was Dishonored 2, your favorite game ever, remember? Dishonored 2, I love, and I still also go, go back to it. Can I hold, hold a candle to Doom 2016? <laughs> You're right. I think it's probably... Doom is a better game, but it, I still love Dishonored 2. But, uh, wow, that was 2016, huh? 2016, yeah. My favorite games: Doom, Final Fantasy 15, Titanfall 2, Super Hot, Stardew Valley, Pokemon Moon, Overwatch, uh, Under, uh, Uncharted 4, Zero Time Dilemma. Wow, that should have been higher, huh? Uh, Deus Ex Machina, Man and Kind Divided, and Street Fighter V and Firewatch. Also, Do you Z- have- Zero Time Dilemma shouldn't have been higher. It was not a very good game. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely <laughs> right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Was Doom on my list at all? I hope so. I don't have your list, bro. Uh, okay. But, um, yeah, so, I just, I just love that game. Griff, do you, pl- do you find yourself going back to it? Um, I, I cleared it. Like you so, hundred, like you hundred percented, and uh, I, I didn't do like all the challenges. Uh, but I went back and like got all the weapons and did all the like, like the challenge events. Uh, I absolutely, I I, I played the multiplayer. I oh, God. think there's a video of me playing it on YouTube. Snap map and friends. <laughs> Snap map, motherfucker. Snap map. <laughs> did you uh, play on a not easiest difficulty? Uh, I did not go back and replay it on a harder difficulty, so I, I played whatever the base model was. But I mean, like when you when you start when you, the first time you play through, there's three difficulty levels. Once you beat it once, then there's five. But do you remember if when you played it, you played it on like the easiest one? I or, played oh. it on whatever was the recommended difficulty. I so probably did not, not go the back. easiest. Probably no. not the easiest one. Yeah. No, but I did. I did spend a lot of time on that game, like going back and like doing the challenges and finding the secrets and trying to you know get all the mods and everything. But it, no, that I, the fact that you're going back to it and like janking, jacking up the difficulty for like a different experience, like that's really exciting because that's everything I've heard too for Doom Eternal, where it's like this is gonna, this is gonna, this is gonna fuck your butt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But suffice it to say, Griff, when you played it, you you were weapon switching, and you would see a certain enemy type, and you would switch to a weapon that you found effective for that enemy, right? Like I played with the super shotgun, and uh, well, the su- when I you- had to switch from the super shotgun, I used a couple other guns, but I've yeah. heard that the same thing where it's like, 
this game encourages weapon switching and and juggling of uh, mechanics and abilities and whatnot. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't want to speak too much about a game I haven't played. Uh, mm-hmm. But I did love the first game, and, and I love the speed of it. And I, I could not get enough of that game. Yeah. So you, yeah, you were probably, I think in the first game, the super shotgun is like the gun and they kind of wanted yeah. it to be that. My, my game of the year in 2016. But, um, I think I never had that experience. Like when I was playing, honestly, when you play on the easiest difficulty, I think I was using like, I was doing something super stupid. Like I think I was using the rail gun, which is really not an all rounder. I was using it like for everything. And that's just not the You were playing the, the game on the easiest difficulty? Yeah, yeah. Just to get to the story of Doom? <laughs> no, just just because I didn't want to be... I just didn't want to have a frustrating experience. Like, in my head at the time, it was like, okay, this is a power fantasy. I don't ever want to feel like I'm even being... Like, I want to be engaged, but I don't want to necessarily even be challenged. So I just was like, okay, I'm just going to ch- choose the easiest one. Which I think is not a bad choice and is fun in its own way, but it's definitely not the experience that you had or that the, that people at the time were having. So it's kind of cool that I get to have that now before the next one comes out, which is, which is fun for me. Mm. But yeah, that's, uh, that's what I've been playing. Right on. Chris, do you want to talk about Kakarot or now? <laughs> oh, that game sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Why does it suck? Just give me like the two minute reason why it sucks. Because I've sure. I've read that it sucks, but I never read the reviews. Um, I, let me tell you this: the reason why I think people think it's good is because there's like an open world nature to it. There's a exploration and uh, traversal thing that that your character can progress, a la Dragon Ball, where you can run real fast and then real faster and then fly and then ideally, if if it, if that fucking game knows what it's good for, there's a a time when you can drive a car and you take the fucking driving test. Like my favorite episode of DBZ that I'm not entirely certain actually exists where Goku <laughs> takes the driver's test. Wait, what? There, is this is this, this may be like a Mandela shit? effect thing here for me, but I'm, I'm like a hundred percent certain there was an episode of DBZ where Goku takes the driver's test and he tries to buckle his seatbelt and it keeps hitting him in the face. Uh, but um, I, I, there's an open world nature where you can, you know, run around from location to location and kind of like crack down, like collect orbs to get power ups and, and, and improve your character stats and so on and so forth. But, um, having played like the game for maybe an hour, it's, it's, hey, did you like Dragon Ball Z? Yes. Yes, I did. Did, do you like a poor handling, uninteresting, uh, fighting game that's not even a fighting game? It's just a, a bunch of nonsense where you match the same button like it is the same Budokai nonsense that the game has always been but with uh, this wrapper of like an open world around it and neither of those things were able to cr- like if if there was more open world and less fighting like if this was like a a dbz rpg with an open world like hell yeah i'm i'm there uh, but it was a DBZ trash fighter, uh, so I'm out. That's too bad. I really like Budokai. <laughs> I'm a very I'm a dum dum. <laughs> You're not a dum dum. I mean, a lot of people like those games. It's it's just I think that DBZ can do a lot. I have higher hopes for that franchise to do something outside of the like. I want to be actively fighting something and like teleporting and doing crazy combos and so on and so forth and like having good visuals, uh, um, you know, excitement. Um, it just, it's just never deep. It's, it, it reminds me of the same trajectory of like wrestling games where it's like, oh, we don't know how to portray this. So we're going to do this same methodology that's not good that we've done from the 90s where you have a meter and you have shitty button combos and you're, you know, you're not really, it's, it's, it's all the spectacle, but none of the actual like oomph of the quality of the, sh- of the show or the situation. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, Kakarot sucks. That's too bad. Mm-hmm. Also, apparently the driving thing is real, and it's also in Kakarot. Mm-hmm. That's all. I've seen things. Yeah, I've seen. Yeah. I've seen bits on it. Yep. All right. Anything else we should cover? I know you got a time time frame, Griff. Yeah. Um. I don't know about the time frame right now, 
but uh, I'm going to take this time to tell you guys about um, the best game so far this year that I've played. Go on. And it's called Dragalia Lost. <laughs> ah! Oh, no. Oh, no. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, buckle up. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I just strapped in. Okay. But the car strap crashed, it. and I'm dead. Uh, no, no, no. no, no, no. It... no strap back out, because it's time to face the monsters of Monster Hunter. Whoa. Go on. Um, so I know you guys give me shit about this game a lot, but... I play They've it. been doing this bizarre partnership with Capcom over the last year, and they had a Mega Man event. They've had a Fire Emblem event. Uh, the Mega Man one was super wild, where you're, you know, you, you get Mega Man as a character, um, and uh, it, it, he's a fire type, which doesn't make any sense, but whatever. Uh, you have to fight the the eight uh, robot uh, masters. Um, but what we're facing right now is this uh, uh, event for... Um, uh, let me just click on it here. Uh, Monster Hunter. Uh, and it's called the Primal Crisis. <laughs> yep. <laughs> what uh, does that mean? Uh, so, so You know what it means. <laughs> the thing that's actually really cool about this game is, is every once in a while they'll do like a major event to kind of throw things on its ear. So like Fire Emblem, they did, um, they changed the game up where it's like, oh, you're going, you're, each person is going to start at a different part in the map and it's more like a, uh, like a, like a strategy RPG where you have to manage different lanes as monster or as enemies are coming down them. And then Mega Man was like, hey, uh, you're going to fight the robot masters and you have to change up your, your loadout, your kit, uh, to accommodate to then, uh, you know, uh, account for like the certain weakness of the robot masters. Uh, and then this one has this really fucking fascinating mechanic where it, uh, typically within Dragalia Lost, like you have to fight a monster and there's a time limit and you're just gonna, you know, either trounce it or you're not up to that level and you'll reach the time limit of five minutes and, and it'll be instant death and you don't, you don't, beat it um in this one it's like uh hey what if we take that time limit away and then we also put like a stat cap limit on it so it's like everybody's like there's set stats you're gonna go and you're gonna fight rathalos and you have set stats bring in your party go to it and actually like learn the boss mechanics learn the movement uh you're gonna it's it's gonna take you 15 minutes to fight this thing but you're you're actually like learning a monster's movements in the same way you would in like a Capcom Monster Hunter game. Uh, so it, it's trying out something really cool and new and 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 I don't know. I think it's worth calling out. Um, it, it's not typically Dragalia Lost updates are like check out this cool new monster gamble. Uh, <laughs> this one is like this is one of those big impactful updates that I think is actually really cool. Where it's like they're partnering with Capcom they're doing something different the game is the game mechanics are changing and it's it's actually like really fun and, and neat so, um how's yeah. the how's the gambling I I haven't gambled uh since gosh like two years ago on it um I haven't spent money on it two years ago but <laughs> you're still be like I haven't gambled since December of 2019 <laughs> <laughs> um, celebrating a month of sobriety <laughs> the uh <laughs> The mechanics are still there. Like they, they, they are definitely making it more friendly for new players or even returning player. Like you know, consistent players saying like, "Oh, here's your free weekend. Get your gambles on." Or yeah, I've, I've heard that Dragalia has a reputation of being relatively generous. It is extremely generous. Like uh, I, I, the okay, we're gonna get in the weeds here. The meta game has the meta game has changed. Uh, the meta game used to just be like, what's your most ex- excessive DPS characters that can output the most amount of damage as quickly as possible? It's now changed to the meta game is like, um, what is your most s- buff friendly characters? Like, is a, a character that can that can boost their and the party's uh, damage output because then once you start combining these things, they stack and you can then do like burst damage on monsters and you can deal with like multiple f- phases so you you go into a, a fight and you you know you're chipping away at it and then you wait until like it's to its third phase and then you 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 execute all your boost damage on it so then you just it basically mitigate the final phase of the monster and you don't have to deal with it uh, so i don't know the game is is buck wild it's also done this thing where it's it's uh cracked the uh the level cap for certain characters which is also upheaving the meta game um it, it's pretty good. All right, cool. I mean, yeah. I probably won't play it, but cool. 
That's fine. <laughs> you don't have to. I uh, I just started an Apple Arcade trial and I grabbed Guildlings. Have you played that, Jamie? No, I still have Apple Arcade. I just canceled my Apple Arcade. (laughs) uh, It looks really cute. I want to get into it, and I wanted to see if if you check it out. It looks like it's um, it's got some it's got some like night in the woodsy vibes. Maybe I don't know. Buildings. Yeah. And and talk talk to me, baby. Oh, I I I played like two minutes of it. I don't know, but basically, it looks like it's uh, like you know kids who are very real like very modern feeling um in like a fantasy world sending each other messages on cell phones and having narrative style quote-unquote battles with monsters and doing magic and stuff looks cool i'm in yeah (laughs) it's 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 uh it's also super cute but i've played literally two minutes of it that sounds cool (laughs) i will uh definitely check it out yeah but that's all that's all i'm after totally uh, that new Final Fantasy VII remake trailer looks amazing. Oh, I haven't really, seen really, it yet. Really cool. I wish they um, right I, when we're done. I wish they made Cloud look more feminine, though. <laughs> it's really weird because it's just it's just Cloud. It's just the same exact face except with pigtails and a dress. And I'm like, where's the makeup at? <laughs> <laughs> that was my one beef. Did you feel the same way, Griff? Um, I. That's why I made the joke about. Sid Highwind's alcoholism and domestic violence because it's like they definitely seem to be taking a different tact on this cross dressing thing than I was expecting, which is cool unless it gets too Japanese. Oh um, yeah, they uh, they they definitely have brought it into the twenty first century mm-hmm. <laughs> or twentieth. I don't know, yeah, probably, one of the two. <laughs> probably the twentieth century. Let's be real here. Probably yeah. the, probably the mid nineties rather than you know like the early. 80s, which is where they previously were. <laughs> totally. Totally. I, the new trailer is bizarre. Like, Red 13, I'm extremely excited about because there that were... was also one of my favorite characters from the yeah. original one. And uh, the, the 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 infusion of new dynamic characters on the, like, evil side seems to be really interesting. I was going to say, there were definitely some new baddies there, right? They are... They are they were subscribing to the Japanese marketing design a la Ben Judd by a commando of like 2006 of like, Hey, you have to have like a character that is like gacked or some like Japanese performer <laughs> that is doing the main theme song, but also rendered into the video game. Wait, really? And they all have to be young and hot. Oh yeah. Shit. There's one of them. I don't know if there's one of them, but the fact that this is being released is like the th- the theme music trailer, and it's a Japanese composer and and yeah. pop star that's singing everything. And I didn't you have think... all these new young characters that are all hot and shit. Yeah, I didn't think that the mus- the the new trailer was that or the new theme was that great, but it is a new Oh, song. absolutely not. No, yeah. yeah. And so uh, I have to give them props for bringing back like the Final Fantasy guy for that. It was, was it Uematsu? I thought it was like a new group of like Hollow or something. Or was that the name of it? Hollow was the name of the track, but it was composed okay. by Uematsu. Yeah, gotcha. So you know, it, it was it was fine. Um, it's very poppy though. Very poppy, uh, but I I still didn't think that it took away from the story beats. I think the thing that really jumped out at me um, in that trailer was just like how how simple it feels compared to where Final Fantasy has gone in terms of like its lore. It's like. Like there's this part in the in the in the trailer where Eris is like, Shinra isn't the true bad guy, and I'm like, that's mm-hmm. so easy. <laughs> right. It's like, this weird spiraling smoke around the Shinra building. That was a little weird, but like to to me, it just felt like it was like, yeah, like I get this. This makes sense. <laughs> I, I'm really excited about it because it's going to be a completely different story, no doubt. Um, which means it might be good. And, oh my uh, god. Uh, no, I'm joking. Sorry. It, it, I, I think that, I think that what they're going to do is, is hone in on more measured moments. Uh, it'll be more character driven. Yeah. Like it won't be the, the like poorly translated rapid beats of Final Fantasy seven of like clouds and avalanche. He doesn't like it. I next, agree. next scene. Uh, it'll be more exploration of what that is. Like what is, the Shinra organization, what is Midgar, what is the the strata that you're living on. So yeah. I'm I'm really excited about that to have that granularity and that that focus in on that level of uh Final Fantasy Seven that never really existed only in like fan fiction or deep lore dives into the expanded universe games. 
But but I would say that like alongside, so I agree with that, Griff. That they, it does feel like there's going to be a deeper dive into these characters. Alongside that, there is a level of restraint that I think I just don't fully believe that like Namura is capable of in terms of mm-hmm. just like not betraying these characters' identities and just sort of letting them be themselves for a little bit longer. You know what I mean? Tell me more. So like Give me an example. Well, they showed like Palmer and I, whatever that lady's name is. I can't remember. Um, and like pr- the president of Shinra and all these people. And it's like, okay, we're going to get a little deeper on them. It never felt like the stuff that they were doing with those characters, like turn them into something ridiculous. Like, I feel like sometimes like th- look at kingdom hearts, right? Like every character in that game is like a caricature. Like they make no sure. sense. Their lore is inscrutable. There's just so much crap going on. And yeah, they did throw in a new character too. And I don't, I don't really care. Um, you know, maybe they'll be interesting. Maybe they won't. But of the characters they showed, I felt like there was still this sort of adherence to the basic story beats. Like, obviously, things are going to be remixed. You're fighting Genova now. Sephiroth mm-hmm. is going to show up earlier. But, like, I, I felt like there was enough sort of recognition of of sort of the, the, the core plot and the simplicity of it alongside further development of these characters. Totally. Yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. They, the the they, way that I, yeah. the way that I, um, the way that I take that in personally is like, this is an interpretation of the Final Fantasy game that should have been, that people wanted, and not like the, oh, seven was so perfect, and then they, they were able to birth this beautiful gem out of it. It's like, no, this is like, <laughs> this is, this is maybe a, a distillation of what they wanted from that <laughs> game into something that has a little bit more meat to it. Yeah, and but but again, like they're not disrespecting the source material, and they're not infusing it with just I think the bullshit that has come to define sure. the Final Fantasy series right now. Like right. just like the ridiculous, Dirt of is- yeah, or just like ridiculous nonsense, like giant boob women, you know, being like, "I'm gonna fix your car and send you on a mission." <laughs> like right. there's none of that. And I'm well, hi. I, every, every time that there isn't that in a trailer, I'm like, "Holy crap." Like, That's a good point. That's a really good observation. Like, yeah. that trailer just opens, and Cloud's like, I want to be a soldier, and, like, go save the world. And I'm like, yeah, that was that scene. Like, has a little more window dressing on it, but, like, you're not you're not making it awful. You're not making Tifa have, like, a bikini on. You're mm-hmm. not, like, you know, like, yeah, there's the weird smoke that, like, tells the future or something, but it even that feels a little bit restrained. They haven't gone crazy with it yet. Well, I think it's also, it's it's restrained, but it's also like, this is different. Like, yeah. uh, what, what is this? It's also like not, you know, oh, it's Mako energy, Mako energy. Yeah. You know, you're like, oh, this is something new. Uh, what's going on here? I so, get yeah, that. Yeah. I, I'm very positive on it. I'm very yeah. excited about it. I, I'm surprised at how positive I am because I just keep expecting them to somehow goof it up. But the trailers feel really good. I fully good. expect it to still be goofed up, which is <laughs> probably why I'm still high on it. Because <laughs> you want it to be goofed? I, I fully expect it to be goofed and, and hot trash, just like most Final Fantasy games for the last 10 years. Oh, my God. I mean, no, that is true. <laughs> don't, you, don't you do that to me. You know I'm right. Except for Crisis Core, the best game ever made. That was previous to 10 years ago. Was it? I don't know. That's scary. <laughs> and I haven't seen any Crisis Core bullshit yet, which makes me very happy. Mm. Anyway. But, yeah. Um any other uh, video game news that's of note? Did uh, you guys see the back of the X about Series X? <laughs> I sure that did. Ports. It does only one HDMI? You know what that means? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Can't can't get my my cable television. I can't get my my uh, achievements for watching the NCISs anymore. <laughs> Phil Spencer said he likes frame rate. You know what yeah. that means? There's nothing at all. <laughs> Literally nothing. <laughs> all right, y'all. I think we're probably good here. There is not a lot of news unless you guys want to talk about anything that I... I and honestly, I think the Final Fantasy stuff is the most interesting. But, oh, yeah. Uh, if sure. there's yeah. anything else... Nope. My okay. cat is also just trying to use my microphone so badly right now. Oh, <laughs> gonna use it. He wants to get all up in there and start nuzzling it. Can we get a little thirst then? <laughs> he, ah. His meows are more like... Yeah, <laughs> that's good meows. Yeah, they're really good. All right. So, 
February, we're there. We made just it. Just going to keep on playing some more Dragon Quest as the year goes on. Sounds like it. It'll yeah. never end. I'm uh, Griff. I hope it. I hope it finds a moment where you where you feel better about it. But if you um, give it a fair shake and it doesn't speak to you, then that is what it is. Totally. All right. Is what it is. 2020. All right, guys. All Goodbye. Right. Bye. Goodbye.